towards Tampa. Cuomo picks up our coverage from New York. Chris Cuomo here. Thank you for joining News Nation on October 7th, a day that should be a unifying, solemn occasion. But it isn't. And so I must ask, have too many of us here in America forgotten to never forget what we learned on 9-11? October 7 was a wake-up call that the world has still not answered. Israel is the tip of the spear, a commitment forged of pain. They say they lost two 1,200 people, murdered in the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. 254 people taken hostage, including a dozen Americans. People from more than 25 nations were taken. A long year later, 97 remained stolen by terrorists. Of the 97, 64 are believed to be alive. That means 33 are confirmed dead. Their families waiting to mourn. Four of the remaining hostages, Americans. Two believed to be children. To the families of the dead, you and they are not forgotten on this day. And we await the day that you can reclaim your loved ones and mourn. And to the families of the 64 believed to be alive, you and they are not forgotten either. I and many others know your anguish, that they have not been rescued, and that too many keep believing that terrorists will ever freely give them back. What happened was real, raw, and true terror. And we were there to see it for ourselves. I ask you to remember. I'm Chris Cuomo. We are here just to the east of Israel, and certainly the night sky has been lighting up once again here. The death count is now well over 1,000, including both sides of this. Uh, The numbers are going to change, and they're going to go up, because this is only the beginning. There is a story here, unlike any we have ever heard before, that concert where these kids were going to celebrate, and hundreds of them were massacred and more brutalized and some stolen. They came in with their guns and said, anyone who can stand up and walk, come out. And Hirsch was one of them. What has been the hardest part so far? It's surreal. Picture your mother and picture her knowing that you're either dead or kidnapped without an arm. That's how I'm doing. My eyes were murdered. My soul was shattered. And you keep saying when I talk to you, I don't know why I'm alive. How are you going to answer that question? I don't know how long it's going to take, but I need help. This is a nation at war, and we saw the areas that were shut down. There are uh, pretty random but regular bomb alarms here that incoming is coming, and they have a very sophisticated alert system that has become habituated as part of the culture here. This is part of everyday life for them. This is a place on edge, and now we'll see what happens. And what if any hope they have for ever seeing their loved ones, who are old, who are frail, who are young, who are desperate, will they ever see them again? We're faced with the same question. Now, I went there as an extension of my profession, but also as an extension of a pledge to never forget when it was us. And now, a year later, How can it be that the same people that hit us are now getting the benefit of the doubt from so many here? Look, it's one thing to care about innocent life lost in Gaza. We should, there or anywhere. It's another to blind yourself to the reason for the same. And it shocks the conscience that so many fail to see Hamas as the echo of the enemy that savaged us. Yes, there are tens of thousands of dead in Palestine. But why? Because Hamas attacked Israel and set their own people up as protection as they hide among them and allow them to bear the price for terrorists' godless acts as the terrorists hide in tunnels that the ordinary cannot reach. Using resources meant for the innocent. That is the truth. And they do it because terrorists don't care about the innocent civilians. And they know that you will. And it works on many, as we've seen here. And now we see the same in Lebanon. Terrorists hide missiles among the multitudes. Why? Because they're willing to sacrifice their own. Because 
the life of their countrymen and women is cheap to them. And because it works, as too many blame those fighting to stop terror instead of blaming the terrorists for what they expose their own people to. But this can no longer be about facts or the why it's happening as it is. It is not about obvious right and wrong. It is about what comes next. That is what today must be about. I fear this does not end soon, and it does not end there. It is one thing for American civilians, especially young ones, to have the luxury of identifying with people in Palestine, even if they may be confused about what and who the enemy is. But that is not a luxury America's leaders can afford. What is happening in the Middle East represents a present and future threat to us here in America, greater than any other. You must realize we are next. It should be a primary focus of this election and of our leadership, but it isn't. There is more fear and more concern about people coming here across the southern border, mostly to work and raise family, than the reality that terror is on the rise. And yes, the immigration system is broken and has been allowed to get worse. But never forget, it was not anyone in South or Central America that came at us on 9-11. It was Islamist extremists. And while I am amazed by our government's efforts to keep us safe all these years, they seem to be the only ones who have obeyed the single command of 9-11 to never forget. That command was not to just memorialize the death of that day, the saintly acts of duty by first responders, but to never forget who did this and why, and to never let it happen again. Yet here we are. We have forgotten that mandate. Not the government, folks. Stopping threats. And God bless them for that. But the rest of us need to wake up. Of course, you can criticize the degree of defense Israel is bringing to bear. And you can care about the need for aid and demand the killing stop. We raised money for the kids in Gaza here at News Nation for good reason. But there must be no forgetting that there is only one enemy in this situation, and it ain't Israel. It is Iran, the head of the snake. Though the more apt metaphor is that they are the octopus, and the tentacles of the octopus are these poison proxies. The Israeli prime minister may deserve criticism for what he has done before and even during this war, but he is absolutely right that it is a war, and that they are fighting on many fronts, and in each and all they are against entities and enemies who all want us dead too. And no. Not simply because we support Israel. That is short-sighted. That is naive. They want us dead because they have a twisted idea of faith, which comes down fundamentally to killing freedom. And we are the lifeblood of freedom on this planet. They want the Jews gone for sure. Always have. But we are next. So maybe the best message for today, at least here in America, is that you may not see Israel's role as I do. That's okay. You may not see the proposition that Jews should be able to live in their own land like anyone else as I do. That's even debatable and okay as such. I don't accept that position, but that's not what matters, okay? Not to you as an American. It should, but... All pain is personal. All interest is driven by self-interest. How will you feel when they come for us here? Because make no mistake, what we are seeing there will be visited upon us. How, when, I don't know. But to think otherwise, especially on this day, is to not heed the wake-up call. Now, We're starting to see a shift, especially with the movement into Lebanon, especially with Iran starting to step up their militarism, and there will be an answer, and that gets dicey. Kamala Harris is now deciding to do media. Good. 60 Minutes 
got asked about this, doesn't want to align herself with Netanyahu. I understand the politics of it. A little dicey right now. Here's the question and answer. A, uh, a real close ally in Prime Minister Netanyahu. I think, with all due respect, the better question is, do we have an important alliance between the American people and the Israeli people? And the answer to that question is yes. Now, my take, okay? I get it. Bibi's not very popular, especially on the left flank of her, pro- her party. And you can argue it either way. It's just not now, because that's Israel's problem. They would have to hold elections. That's not going to happen right now. So either it's your ally or not. It's not about the people for the people. It's about the state and the state, because that's who's calling the shots, right? And if she wins and becomes president of the United States, or if it's former President Trump, it's going to be on them to decide, what do you do about Iran? I was surprised, and we'll see the rest of the interview. It is 60 Minutes. That's all I'd be talking about is Iran. What do you understand about it? What are you going to do about it? What are the contingency plans? What are the different uh, areas of focus you can bring to bear on them? Where are we? Let's discuss it, okay? Let's bring in someone who's been outspoken and influential, and rightly so, not just as a Jewish American, but as a thought leader for us here, especially since October 7th of last year. Founder and editor of the Free Press, which is an absolute gift Uh, to dialogue in this country. Barry Weiss, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. And and really, thank you, Chris, so much for everything that you've done to report on this story over the past year. I've been watching, and like so many Americans, I'm really grateful. What am I missing? Why is it that in America, we are not seizing on the reality that, oh, they're back. The terrorists have reorganized. This is it. The money is flowing. Uh, The passion is flowing. Here we go again. What am I missing? What you're missing is the flourishing of an ideology that has gone unchecked. Really, I mean, it could go deeper and back before September 11th, but I think we can both acknowledge that if we went back to September 12th, 2001, the idea that any young person on the streets of America would be going out and waving the flag of al-Qaeda or cheering, you know, long live the glorious martyr Osama bin Laden, we would think that they were depraved. They would be pushed out of polite society. And yet here we are, you know, 20 something years later, and right outside our office tonight, I went out and listened to thousands of young people, and they were mostly young people, shouting about how what happened today, a year ago in Israel, the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust, butchering, maiming, burning, and raping, was resistance, that these were the forces of liberation and justice. And if you want to understand how they're shouting that, you have to understand that they have embraced a post-truth worldview, which erases the bright line between good and evil, which decides in sort of a predetermined way that some people are victims and some people are victimizers, that hates America, that hates the Enlightenment, that hates the West, and that is fundamentally trying to wage a kind of psychological and political war here on the home front. And so on October 7th... Go ahead, Barry, finish your point, please. No, I was was simply going to say that there's two catastrophes that we mark on this day. The one is the catastrophe that murdered 1,200 people and took more than 250 captive. That's the one catastrophe and the war that Hamas began on this day when it massacred innocent people. The second catastrophe is the failure by the West, or at least by many in the West, of a critical moral test. Do you stand with that mother whose picture you you showed in the beginning of this episode, or sorry, in the beginning of this show? Young mother Shiri Bibas with her nine-month-old baby and her four-year-old redheads clinging to them? Or do you side with the barbarian who dragged them into the tunnels under Gaza? The fact that we even have to have that discussion is a sign of how far the rot in this country has traveled. And it's a sign of the stakes of this war, this war that we're in for the West, and how crucial it is that we summon all of our courage and all of our conviction to fight it. 
Iran as the unspoken enemy too often in American political dialogue. Uh, why do you believe there's such a gentle touch when it comes to that country? And what do you think has to change no matter who wins in this election? I think that there is a um, foolish worldview group think that's embraced by many in Washington and has been going back to the Obama administration that believed that the way to stop Iran from getting nuclear weapons was, they called it the JCPOA or the Iran deal. I would call it appeasement. And we've seen, whether you agreed with it or not at that stage, I don't think it's possible, given the fact pattern, to now defend that worldview, to now defend that policy. When I hear, you know, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris talking about how there needs to be a ceasefire right now between Lebanon, even though it's not a war against Lebanon, it's a war against Hezbollah, and Israel, I think to myself, was nothing learned in the 365 days since October 7th, 2023? How can there be a ceasefire with a genocidal group at a democracy's border, one that has been waging war since October 8th and has displaced something like 80,000 Israelis, effectively letting a terror group redraw the boundaries of the northern part of the state of Israel? You, there can't be a cease. No one wants war, but there can't be a ceasefire. There has to be victory against a group like that. Because I think one of the lessons of October 7th is believe these people when they say they want to murder you. When the Ayatollah gets up, the Supreme Leader in Iran got up over the weekend and gave a sermon for the first time in five years, talked about how the malicious regime of Israel needs to be destroyed or something along those lines. He's not speaking metaphorically. Believe them in what they're saying. That is one of the great lessons of the past year. And the fact that we can't speak plainly, regardless of your political party, about the threat that Iran poses, about its alliance with China, Russia, North Korea, and all enemies of the United States, it, it absolutely boggles the mind. And, you know, look, it's easy to write it off as over there question is, how will we respond uh, when it visits us here? And to believe that, you know, it's an if as opposed to when is naive with what we have lived through. Um, Barry Weiss, I appreciate uh, what you're doing with the free press. I appreciate you coming here. Uh, you are always uh, an invitation away, and the invitation is always open. This is a very important dialogue, and it's not going to end with our election, and it's not going to end anytime soon. So to be continued. Thank, Thank you for you so joining much. me on October 7th. All right. So now let's look at what happens next. You heard what Barry said, uh, and that's a di very direct analysis. Bibi Netanyahu over the weekend was basically saying to the allies in Europe, look, if you're not with us, that's fine. We're going to fight this anyway because it's existential for us. But boy, are you sleeping on the threat? And he was talking specifically to the leader of France. And I got to tell you, it was an interesting point, given the lessons that France has learned about Islamist extremism in a way uh, that really, you know, what I watched happen there with Charlie Hebdo uh, and the Bataclan and how they attacked people in that kosher market, you would think they would know, right? But it's very easy to ignore when it's not you. So what happens next? And what are the considerations for us? Let's be selfish about it, okay? Let's be selfish about it. Forget about how you feel about Israel. What does it mean for us? All right, if that's the way it has to be, fine. Let's discuss it in that way. The chair of urban warfare studies at West Point, John Spencer, joins us now, friend of show. Uh, John, thank you for uh, joining me on such an important day. And I know that you understand the larger responsibility of what Israel is doing versus us. But let's talk about it as if we don't feel that way. It's just about America and what it means for us. What do you believe people need to know? about the reach of the rot that is in the Middle East right now? Uh, I think they should know it's here already. I mean, from the ridiculous, disgusting things that we're seeing on our TV, on our college campuses, cowards that don't even wear masks, that radicalization leads to rot. It leads to more terrorist attacks. It leads to that internal decay from external influence of the Islamic regime in Iran, of Russia, influencing these youths who can believe all these lies and 
They're not the civil rights movement. They're not the anti-Vietnam crew. They're literally out there marching for rapists, terrorists. They're calling for the destruction of all the Jewish people. They chant one solution. The realization from our leaders, our leaders here, whether that's a college campus or in our congressional seats, is that it's here now, and if we don't do something about it, it's only going to get worse. This is a red flashing light of severe catastrophe happening here, let alone our foreign policy with the Islamic regime. So uh, answer uh, this deflection. Um, Well, I don't know, John. Uh, You know, these are people who've got a misplaced sense of privilege, and they're trying to reach out to the oppressed, and uh, they feel like that's what they need to do. It gives them meaning and purpose. Uh, They'll move on. And we saw how soon as school let out, uh, they were mostly gone. And now school's back. And here we are on October 7th. So they're doing it. And Iran, they can't really touch us here. So let's help Israel uh, to the extent that we have to. But the problem stays in the Middle East. Your response? That's the lack of, I mean, that's ignorance. I mean, they're attacking Jewish communities in our homes. They're attaching American Jewish people. They're attacking their synagogues, their Chabad's, their schools. They're attacking, let alone the fact that there are American citizens in captivity with Hamas that were killed on October 7th. It's freaking ridiculous. They're attacking us, the Americans. They're attacking our values of what is right and wrong. Who do we stand for? This is already an attack of the American society, and we're seeing it in front of our TVs and we're, we're asleep at the wheel. So what do we do? What is the option? What is the decision chain here? There's no will among the American electorate right now for boots on the ground, although they should know. We've been moving in tens of thousands of people to help with evacuations and other logistical things that makes our fighting men and women vulnerable in the region. Um, but there's no will to be on the ground. Certainly Trump, um, while he's had a strong affinity for Bibi Netanyahu, He is not one to commit troops in the Middle East. Harris, you heard what she just said. The people of Israel and the people of America have a bond. I don't even know what that means um, because it's about state actors, not about citizenry. Uh, So what is the decision chain for America? Number one is to stand with our friends. We stand with our friends who are being attacked. They're not at war with seven different fronts. They're being attacked daily by seven different fronts. They couldn't even have a Remembrance Day for October 7th without the Houthis launching a surface-to-surface rocket and sending millions into captivity. So first, we need to have a unified message that we stand with all the Jewish people of the world, and we stand with Israel in defending its citizens. That's number one. And number two is we need to have clarity on what that means, who are the oppressed and who are the oppressors, that it isn't okay on our college campuses or anywhere to wear a mask and a kafia and chant hate crimes, anti-Semitism. We need to ratify these ideals that we've had that no, from the river to the sea is a genocidal call, and it won't be accepted on social media or especially in our college campuses. I'm scared for my kids to go to school because of this inaction. I have no problem with bad ideas. In America, you get to express your bad ideas, and it allows them to be exposed and reduced by better ideas. My concern is 100 rockets uh, hit Israel today uh, from different points of resistance in the South mostly. If one rocket like that went off and hit one bus in America and killed a group of Americans, everything would change. And we need to stay ahead of that with policies and people who are thinking the right way about how to blunt the threat of Iran instead of just waiting for the American people to be outraged by what happens here. we got to remember the lesson of 9-11. You and I lived it. And we got to remember that the idea of never forget wasn't just about that day. It was about who did it. John Spencer, to be continued, appreciate you as a resource to my audience. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Four minutes, five seconds. Coming up, let's talk about the politics. Harris, she's heard the criticisms. I'll do a media blitz, podcasts, late night shows, The View, 60 Minutes, Howard Stern, interesting choice. What does this mean? What's the plus minus on this? Let's take a look next.
governor of Arkansas said, my kids keep me humble. Unfortunately, Kamala Harris doesn't have anything keeping her humble. How did that make you feel? I don't think she understands that um, there are a whole lot of women out here who, one, are not aspiring to be humble. Now, this is not the 1950s anymore. Families come in all kinds of shapes and forms. Where is she? That is the number one podcast for female listeners. Call her daddy. This is part of Harris's response, uh, not really to people saying you got to do more. You know what she's responding to. This race is locked up. And a Democrat, to win the presidential election, has to win the popular vote by, you know, 3%, 4%, depending on who you want to listen to. To win the Electoral College, that's a metric that they usually follow. And this race latched up like that, this is now time to do everything. What is the lesson that the Democrats had to learn from Hillary Clinton? You do not leave anything on the court. You spend every bit of energy. You do everything you may be able to do to win because otherwise, then it's on you. So is this the right call for her right now, doing it the way she's doing it? Let's debate. Bring in former GOP national spokesperson, uh, Madison Jeziato, and host of the Aggressive Progressive podcast, Chris Hahn. And I stipulate early, um, Chris, don't be upset just because there's one of mine against you tonight. I'm not going to just give deference to the Italian. Don't worry. <laughs> so why hey, are I'm you happy, Hahn? Oh, you forget. You forget. Well, you know, you, you, you shouldn't have buried okay. the name then, brother. You shouldn't have buried the name, okay? <laughs> That's what you get for burying the name. So, Chris, let's talk turkey. Two and a half um, Italians here. Two and a half. Her going uh, and doing media blitz, what's the upside for you as you see it? I think it's great. Uh, first of all, I'm a huge Howard Stern fan coming from Long Island. I think it's great that she's going on Stern. I think if Hillary Clinton had gone on Stern in 2016, we might have had a different result. I love that she's going on podcast. She's always welcome on the Aggressive Progressive. We have video now, too. So come on in, uh, Vice President. Not as big of an audience as call her, uh, call me daddy. <laughs> yes, uh, but sure. it's, it's uh, uh, look, <laughs> yeah, 100%. Uh, but I think it's a great thing that she's doing it. I think there's still a lot of gnashing, and t- gnashing of teeth from other uh, journalistic outlets that are saying, why aren't you coming to me? But I think this is a good start. I think she should do more. I think she should be very aggressive in the strategy. I would encourage her to go on Fox, maybe sit down with a Martha McCallan or a Brett Baer, who are center-right, but I think could be fair with her, and I think she'd handle them well. So I think she needs to, uh, to do more of this, do it often, have a drumbeat of appearances so no one appearance matters all that much. Jesse Otto, is this a case of be careful what you ask for, that you guys wanted her to do more media, now she's doing a huge blitz uh, just a month out of the election? You know, I don't think a good start is good enough when we have less than 30 days until November 5th. I mean, hindsight, of course, will always be 2020, but I think the question for Kamala Harris and her team right now is, is it too little too late? I mean, you have states like Georgia and Arizona where voter registration ended today. Uh, so she's out there and she's, you know, one-fourth of the country says, hey, we need to know more about you. She's finally going out there and doing some interviews, but she's going to comfortable places. I mean, this Call Her Daddy podcast is 90% female listenership, many of these being very young women. And I think the reality is that's not where she needs to be. The audience she needs to be talking to is men. The audience she needs to be talking to is rank and file union voters, minorities, people who she's losing support of. And of course, most importantly, those swing voters, people who just aren't sure how they're going to vote. And when polling continues to reflect that they want to hear more details on her policies and they want to hear more from her uh, in that context, I don't think she's punching above her weight class. And that's important for her right now. I will say this. And then, Chris, I want to know why uh, Jesse Otto hurt your feelings there. I heard you. Um, I am surprised that I haven't heard about her doing something with News Nation yet because it's overweighted independent. And I don't know how in a race this tight you think your base is enough. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have to be with me. I'm, I'm fine. You got a lot of great people you could do with at News Nation. But I'm a little surprised by that. I'm surprised about that with Trump also, to be honest. You know, independents are going to likely deli- decide this election in like three dozen counties and four states. I'm surprised that they're not coming to a place that, you know, has an op- overweighted sample. Uh, Han, why were you offended by what Jesse Otto said? Well, one, 60 Minutes is not a fluff interview. Neither is Howard Stern, by the way, one of the best interviews ever. And also, going on that podcast actually makes sense because while she's doing incredibly well with women, 
young women and young people in general have are, are low propensity voters. You've got to be in their face mm-hmm. all the time. You've got to meet them where they are. So going on that podcast helps her with a base and with the demographic she's doing well with and reminds them that they need to vote and how important the election is. So I think it's a very good move for her to do that. Yeah, and they are low propensity voters. But again, you mentioned so many of those states that I talked about earlier that voter registration's over. A lot of these young people aren't even registered to vote. Of course, we're seeing a push on both sides to get them registered. uh, But when registration's over, that's not going to help. And Georgia, a critical swing state, and Arizona, a state she could potentially win. And so that's, that's what I was mentioning earlier. And then, of course, with young people, very low propensity voters. You look at 2020, you look at 2022, we saw them vote in higher percentages than ever before. But yet it's still nothing mm-hmm. compared to the over 60 voting demographic. Uh, Madison, yeah. look, the look, dominant issue the on... of the election. And... Oh, no, please finish your point. No, no, we're in the end game of the election now. She's out there trying to get people out. People are paying attention more and more as each day goes by in the month of October. So she's got to be out there. Look, she's reaching men. She's reaching women. She's all over the place uh, the next couple days. Stephen Colbert, Howard Stern's audience is like 70% men. Right, but she's not winning those men, uh, and that's her problem. So, yes, that's good for her to go on Howard Stern, but if she doesn't win the men that are listening, it's a problem. If you won't even take a question from Fox News, how can you expect these men to trust that you'll be strong enough to take, you know, what's going to come against you from Russia, from China, from North Korea? I think that she's peeling off a lot of college-educated men right now. I think that's a big problem for Trump. In fact, if the election was held today, she'd have more college-educated white men than any Democrat in the last 40 years. I think it's a pretty good, good statistic But she's for bleeding in other so she's areas. She's moving the, moving the needle there. And, and, on, and the Stern Show might have a lot of Trump supporters that listen. If she takes 1% of them, that's a huge loss for, for, uh, for, for Trump. So she's doing what she needs to do, and she's moving the needle. People want to complain. When Trump goes to the media, he doesn't answer questions and he lies. He lies about everything he's asked. She's going on there and yeah, she's it's, having real conversations it's built about in. issues that matter to Americans. But it, it's built in. This is my, my take on this and talking with uh, Alan Lickman, the professor who I have uh, coming on, the guy with the 13 keys. You know, he, he's like 10 for 10 yeah. in the last 10 presidential elections. Um, Trump's negatives are built in. They're baked in. They're not going to move. If anything changes that hurts somebody, it's going to be what hurts Harris. Harris's opportunity to win this election is in getting away from enragement and making it about engagement, that people believe there's a shot she'll be able to do anything. I want to get one quick take from each of you before I let you go, because it's October 7th. I have not been impressed by either candidate on this issue. Let's start with Trump, Madison. Um, yes, he has an affinity for Bibi Netanyahu. He's been good. He moved the, the uh, consulate to Jerusalem. But in terms of what to do about Iran, he seems to be almost entirely backward looking that people screwed up. They didn't have the money when I was there. What do you believe Trump does to control Iran if he is elected? Well, I think one of the things when you look back to 2016, so many people said we're going to go into World War III if Trump were elected. It was the most peaceful we've seen, not only, you know, our country, but the world uh, in decades. And so I think peace through strength has been his greatest strength on this. Of course, he's been a huge supporter of our ally, our greatest and only ally in the Middle East uh, that we can really count on. And so I think moving forward, you look to people. Yes, I think it would be great to see him get more of that Jewish vote. But the reality is they tend to vote Democrat. Uh, It's unlikely that he'll peel off many more people on that front. But yet, he, I think, is stronger on the issue than she is. And she somehow managed to offend people on both sides of this issue, which I think is going to be hard for her, especially in places like Detroit and otherwise. There is an opportunity because Trump is so loath, Chris, to create a foreign footprint. And I get where his brain is on it, you know, that what's in it for us? You know, we'll help the Jews. We're giving them weapons. They'll take care of it themselves. There's an opportunity in that because they can't make Iran go away, okay? And you're not going to do it militarily. The question is, do you augment if Iran steps it up, which probably doesn't happen? Do you find political and economic ways to push for regime change there? Harris is all but silent on this. Does that concern you? It's a big issue. Well, look, foreign policy rarely decides an election. And I will agree with Madison that there is an issue in Detroit that Harris needs to get her hands around with a certain uh, segment of the Muslim population there. But look, this is a crisis that's been going on. There's been a, this is a conflict that's been going on for longer than the state of Israel has existed. I don't expect Harris or Trump to solve it in the confines of a campaign. But whoever no, the next president is, I believe it'll be No, but they have to talk about not Harris. letting us get hit here. Again, hold on. 
The issue is not peace in the Middle yeah, East. Yeah, you're right. That, that's, you're, don't get it twisted. You're right. Twisted. And I saw I, Iran I, would love to blow up something in our country. That's right. You're right, and and it would be the biggest mistake Iran ever made, no matter who the president was. And I think that mm. Paris and Trump should both make that point. And I think Joe Biden should be making that point on a daily basis as well. Brother, when you're dealing with somebody who's okay with a one-for-one exchange in life, that's a really tough enemy to beat. That's way we did it for 20 years, killed tens, hundreds of thousands of people in all these different countries. Iran is still there doing what it's always done worst. And both both administrations, both parties have not sealed this threat. Um, Chris Hahn, appreciate you. Madison Jesse Otto, very good to have you. Welcome to the show. Please come again. Good to be with you. Thank you. All right. Take care, guys. Four minutes, 30 seconds. Up next, four weeks from the election. All right. Neck and neck. That's scary for Democrats. Why? Again, what I said, when Democrats win for president, that means they win the Electoral College, right? They almost always win the popular vote by a significant margin. What does that mean about this race being deadlocked right now for Democrats? And October surprises. The man who says it's going to be Harris based on the 13 keys. He still feel that way? What if there's an October surprise? Competing thoughts about the relevance of an October surprise. Next. All right. Let's not mess around. Let's bring in two much better minds, okay? Professor Alan Lickman, the creator of the 13 Keys to the White House, all right? And Frank Luntz, pollster, communications consultant, a professor up at West Point. Uh, Both trusted sources and mentors for me. Uh, One, Lickman, uh, are you got shaky knees over your pick with the polls being so tight? I'm 77 years old and I get butterflies in my stomach every four years but I don't change my prediction in response to the polls. If I did, I would have been dead wrong about 2016. I would have been dead wrong about 2012 when the polls turned against Obama around this time in October. I would have been dead wrong about 1988 when George H.W. Bush fell 17 points behind. My system is based upon the fundamental forces that drive elections, that is, It's governing, not campaigning that counts. And the keys gauge the strength and performance of the White House party. And this whole idea of an October surprise is a huge myth. I've always made my uh, predictions before then and never changed them. And I'm respecting Trump in 2016. We had this immense surprise of the Access Hollywood tape with Trump bragging about assaulting women. Pundits were saying he's dead. You've got to change your prediction. I didn't, and I was right. Uh, Frank Luntz, what do you believe of the mythology uh, versus the matter of fact of an October surprise? Alan Lickman is brilliant, and he's proven it through decades and decades of success. So I'm not going to challenge it. I'll also acknowledge that the polling this year is not indicative of virtually anything. The swing states, only all seven of them are within two points of each other. It is unclear that the presidential debate between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris had any impact at all. Now, let me be candid, Chris, because I think it's important where we acknowledge where we get it wrong. I thought that Trump's performance was so horrific in that debate that that would kill him, and it has not. And I'll also emphasize to viewers right now that Trump has incredible staying power and that even though he seems to be unhinged, his own voters don't mind. In fact, they seem to embrace it. Chris, I think it's too close to call. I've never been afraid to make a prediction. But in those states and among those key voting blocks, Donald Trump is doing surprisingly well. And Harris has been unable to close the deal. Um, for the people, Frank, the idea of an October surprise, do you believe in that? And what would it have to look like to make a difference in this election? The October surprise is Joe Biden dropping out. The October surprise is Donald Trump being shot. The October surprise Mm -hmm. is Donald Trump being potentially shot at a second time. The October surprise is Israel and Gaza and Hamas and Hezbollah. The October surprise We've been having it again and again and again. We just had it in September, or we had it in August, or we had it in July. So, yes, we've been, this has been the most shocking, unstable 
election in terms of the events that have been happening. But Chris, the polling data has been surprisingly stable. And right. Harris has not moved at any point in the last two weeks. So I think we've got a race that is simply too close to call. Yeah, it feels a lot like 2004 uh, to me in terms of how locked up it is. Uh, but Professor Lichtman, doesn't that mean that the Democrats have to be what we call in Italian the gagarelle, which is the nervous stomach, because they have to win the popular vote to win the, ele you know, the electoral college. I'm not saying as a matter of uh, political science. I'm saying that historically um, they don't win the presidency in the electoral college if they haven't had a pretty healthy margin in the popular vote. If it's so locked up, what does that portend? We don't know that it's so locked up. You know, uh, Frank Luntz is brilliant, and I don't disagree with anything he said. But let me give a little bit of a gloss on the polls. They tell you the error oh, margin. The love fest. The love fest between Luntz and Lickman. Oh, no, <laughs> bleeding hearts of the world, unite. Go ahead, Unite. Lickman. And you know what, Chris? I want to give you a shout out for what you said about the Middle East. I'll quote what Dwight Eisenhower said 70 years ago. There is no military solution to the Middle East. Now, back to this race. The pollsters tell you the error margins plus and minus 3%. That's pure statistical error. On top of that, you have the era of non-response, people lying, people not focusing and changing their minds, and you don't know who the likely voters are. That at least doubles the election, the error margin of the polls, which means it's plus and minus 6%, six which means there has to be a gap of about 10 points at least for the polls to be reliable. Plus, the top of the statistical error is unidirectional, not random. The polls underestimated Republican voting strength in 2016. Okay. But from what we know about 20, 23, and 24, by five points or more, they're underestimating Democratic performance, as we saw in the race for the seat held by George Santos. The poll had at one point, the Democrat won by eight points. Mm. But that was Swazi, and he's pretty locked in in that community. Um, all right, I got to jump. Frank Luntz, I, I owe you an answer. I'll give it to you next time we talk. I appreciate you very much being on the show. Professor Lickman, thank you very much. You didn't think I'd pull that Swazi fact out of my pocket the way I did there. That's okay. <laughs> Don't sleep on me. I'm not just hair and teeth. I'll see you guys soon. Three minutes and 45 seconds. Uh, if you look at that race, Tom Swazi had held the seat before. Santos, you know, was an injured bird, right? The vacant seat. But uh, Swazi had a lot of advantages in that race, and I think that's one of the things people underestimated. But two of the best minds in the business, now you have food for thought. Now you have a question? Great. Let's get after it. 844-968-7720. All right, Dusty, who do you got? Uh, okay, quickly, we have Nathaniel from Nashville, Tennessee. Okay, brother, what's your question? My question is, why does the American media put more importance on the 1,200 colonizers that were killed versus the 41,000 indigenous people. Well, first of all, uh, the way you're setting it up is a false premise, okay? And, you know, it's okay to be sympathetic to the conditions in Palestine, the lack of sovereignty, the lack of validation of their own lives and control over the same. But blame Hamas. There is a terror group, and yes, Israel helped develop that group early on as an offset to the PLO. Yes, we all know the history, but they are what they are right now, brother. And they're a bunch of terrorists as designated by our government. All right. And they're not colonizers. That was the Balfour Doctrine after World War II, where there was a recognition of world powers that Jews had a right to return to the homeland and to have their own boundaries and to have their own nation and that's what it was and this isn't just about not liking where the lines are it's about an existential threat to them so it's not about colonizers versus um indigenous that's not what it is that may work here right um in terms of the history of america it's not the history of there it's about terror the same people that wanted to kill you on 9 11 and would love to do so again do you want to side with them Keep it up. Next. Okay, next. We've got three minutes. Let's get two more. Matthew from Los Angeles, California. Matthew, what's hey, your Chris. question? 
Hey, Chris, as a Jewish American, I want you to know you've been a shining light for me this year and for so many of us. I have not missed an episode all year. I have not, I wouldn't have gotten through this year if it hadn't been for you. And I want to say thank you. You've been so amazing. I'm Israel High. Well, that is uh, a very generous assessment. I'm sorry uh, that the support feels rare and uh, isn't obvious. Um, and as we both know, look, plenty of room. Criticism of BV is the the wrong guy to make peace, and what he was doing in Israel before, and what he and the degree of of uh, violence and militarism in the posture of Israel right now. Argue about all of it; it's fine. But the idea that you put Israel on the same platform with terrorists is crazy. I just I never thought that in America we'd see people equivocating and giving deference to the same people we fought for 20 years. Just crazy to me. One more call, call, please. Okay, one more. Ron from Lindbrook, New York. Yeah, Chris, when, hey, your, brother ran for, when your brother ran for mayor once uh, this debacle is going to go down in New York with Adam, do you think he'll run for off your brother? I mean, look, you know, look, the obvious punt, the obvious punt is he's got to answer his own questions, right? Yeah, he, he's, he's, he's a big boy. He speaks for himself. I'm the little brother, not the big brother. Um, but look, here's the way I see it. Um, I love my brother very much, and I never had to look outside my own family for role models. I feel like he's done so much, and there's such a high price for, for getting into that game now, especially in his party, that I don't know why he seems so motivated to serve. And I know he's hearing people tell him to run, but man, there's a lot of ifs in this. Is Adams in or is Adams out? Uh, is it a special election or is it a primary? Uh, how, how radicalized left is the party structure in that special election or primary? Who else runs? I mean, there are a lot of ifs. I, I think for a lot of people, it seems simple. Uh, Andrew Cuomo should get in. Andrew Cuomo shouldn't get in. I think there are a lot of pieces. But the most important piece is my brother's conviction. And all I know is he does not share my disrespect for the process. My brother believes that public, just like my father did, he believes that public service is the best, if not the only way uh, to dedicate your life. He just believes it. So I know he wants to serve. I don't know how, I don't know what, but I know he's hearing what people are saying. We got a long- 